The rapid deployment of new technology is having a profound effect on users across the world. Dr. Julie Albright, digital sociologist at the University of Southern California and member of the Board of Directors of Infrastructure Mason, talks to us on the impact of digital. Um, Dr. Julie, thanks a lot for talking to us. Let's start with thanks the basics. For me. What is a digital sociologist? Well, originally, uh, when I went to study sociology for my PhD, I said I wanted to look at the impact of computing on society. Mm. And they said to me, what, it, what does that have to do with <laughs> sociology, actually? So they didn't even know what it was. But now everybody knows. I mean, the idea that you can just walk down the street and see people looking at their phones mm. and, you know, running into each other practically. And, and posts. Yeah, everything is becoming digitized now. So it's really reshaping uh, our behaviors and reshaping society. So I got in on it before people really knew what it was all about. And now, mm. you know, it's very evident that mm. this is a major societal impactor. Mm. Well, with this all impacted, would you say that we're living in a healthy digital age? Well, I think there's pluses and minuses to it. Obviously, it's fun to be connected. You can have you know, friends all over the world. You can get to know people, even relatives that don't live nearby mm. through their Facebook posts or Instagram and things mm. like that. Um, and there's also been a lot of cases where people are using things like Twitter for mm. uh, you know, uh, bad governmental issues or you know, societal wrongs and really getting the word out as sort of citizen journalists. Mm. So it's had some positive okay. effects. But having said that, um, a lot of people that are using this social media in particular, it's very addictive. It's mm. built, in fact, just like the gambling machines where you pull the one-armed bandit and you want to just keep pulling, keep pulling. It has baked into it behavioral drivers that make people want to come back for more. Mm. And in that sense, mm. it's now addictive mm. technology. So that's the thing is that people are getting so wrapped up that they're actually disconnecting from other people and disconnecting from relationships, like at dinner, for example. Mm. Everyone's on their device, and they're not really engaging mm. with the people around them or with the environment mm. around them. Could you envision this changing? People start stopping using social media, or have we gone too far at the moment, and people just can't stop it? Well, I think that, again, I think the fact that the average person doesn't even realize that these, uh, these things are uh, um, addictive in a sense uh, they and in fact they probably don't care it's pleasurable to get likes it's pleasurable to get feedback from friends and so being socially um, accepted mm -hmm. online and I think another point that's important to think about is there are generational differences here this mm. isn't straight across the board okay. when you look at older individuals they're much less likely to be doing these things mm. than younger and in fact now we have babies that have better digital skills than some of our senior citizens so it's really this matter of growing up in it and that everything becomes connected, everything mm. becomes digitized. But the older you get, the less likely you're going to okay. be that immersed in it. Okay. Well, one of the industries that really benefits from this addiction and from the digital natives as well <laughs> is the data center and cloud industry. Certainly. What is the responsibility in making sure that the digital infrastructure is used correctly? Um, to also start avoiding a little bit more these sort of reactions from mm -hmm. the from the, the users. Well, I think that's the thing. It's sort of it's become so mainstream now. It's not like a hobby okay. for some computer uh, person that's really interested in dialing up a little bulletin board like mm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, originally it was just researchers and computer scientists and things like that on the internet. Now that it's gone so mainstream, it's actually starting to reshape elections, reshape our society in ways that we might not like. So mm. as the technologies have matured, let's say, and they're still growing, of course, uh, the impacts are so large now that we have to kind of t take a step back mm. and think about the responsibilities of you know, some of these big providers mm. to uh, verify information, mm. the provenance of information, and verify identity. In other words, who is this person? And what are the trust markers that we can make visible okay. so people know that information is trustable and also the person? Mm. Okay. That brings me starting to the, the hacking side of the story here. Yes. And also outages. Outages are massive in the data center space. And if something happens, it's really bad. Yes. But on the hacking side, mm. what? How can a hack change people's relationship with a provider? Right. Mm. Uh, in terms of if it's a, a, a down, uh, if there's an outage or situation? hacking, something that yeah. will impact the yeah. user's data. Right. Um, what's their relationship right. with the provider like? Right. So yeah. I think what's happening now is mm. the expectations around life are changing because mm. of digital technology. It mm. spins so fast 
that younger people in particular expect a no latency life. Mm. So the idea that they want it right now. Mm. Um, if <coughs> one of the car services is too slow, they're going to call the other mm. one. You know, if a film takes too long to download, they're going to go on Some to else. something else. So this idea of a no latency life becomes an expectation around this digital culture and society. So if there's an outage or you know someone's hacked and they can't access a website, this happened in Los Angeles, by the way. Facebook went down one day uh, about a couple years ago. It was dark so many people called 911 mm. to report an emergency that the sheriff actually took to Twitter to say, Facebook is not our responsibility. Mm. We don't know when it's coming back up, and it's not a police emergency. People called the emergency number to report Facebook going mm. down. That's how important it is to them and it's almost shocking if you think about it. So would you say that this low latency life, this is quite unhealthy then? Well it can be, yes. Uh, mm. One of the fellows was talking to me here uh, at mm. this conference and saying that the um, game that his son was playing went down and it said to restart his router. So the son went and took apart the router, cords were everywhere and all of a sudden all of his kids were there sobbing crying because the internet was down and he was looking at his kids crying and, and almost started laughing about it but that's how critical it is mm. that the kids are actually crying within three minutes of it mm. going down well there's been studies that younger generations prefer to have internet or wi-fi in a hotel than hot water there so it is yeah, yeah. Is life <laughs> yeah they'd rather mm. lose their wallet or purse than not have internet mm. Uh, they think it's as important as food, water, or air. So it's really part of uh, integrated into their everyday life mm. as something that's not uh, something that they want, but rather something they mm. need. Mm. Okay. And when we look into the next computational stage, so the edge computing, I'm talking about edge computing, mm -hmm. uh, we will have driverless cars, which some people are still critical about. Yes. We will have AI automation, which yes. people are still very much critical about, especially because of the jobs situation. Mm -hmm. um, how will edge change consumers' relationship? Right. Well, I think that people always have been saying now, as things are spinning up faster and faster, that we've always had technologies changing society. For example, they always bring up, you know, the horse and buggy and the automobile and that idea that, well, we got used to not having horses. But what they don't understand is now that the spin-up rate has become so fast. Mm -hmm. It took 30 years mm -hmm. for telephone or telegram or the car to reach full market penetration, like a majority of market penetration. Mm -hmm. Now these technologies are spinning months. up within like a month or a year. Mm -hmm. And you can't retrain for new jobs that fast. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm not sure all these new jobs are going to uh, mm -hmm. develop. Uh, at, uh, let me re-say that again. Yeah. I'm not sure new jobs are going to develop at the speed that they're going to be wiped out okay. by things like AI. Mm -hmm. So we're going to end up with a problem of what are we going to do with all these people when they can't make a living. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people are saying that we should just pay them like a universal basic yeah. income. The problem is a job represents more than just money mm -hmm. and that's that's what's if you think of an array of things one you know identity it, it schedules your day things like that and who you are and your social mm -hmm. position and it keeps you occupied mm -hmm. and it gives you a sense of meaning and purpose. And goals and accomplishments. Yeah, goals and accomplishments and it, it draws you to the future. You're going to mm -hmm. move up in the company or something. Yeah. But, and money. But money is only a very small piece of that array. Mm -hmm. So if you take the whole array out mm -hmm. and only replace the mm -hmm. money bit, what about the rest of these mm -hmm. things? So that will be the problem mm -hmm. on the horizon is this idea of, of sort of anno me. Who, where am I going? What am I mm -hmm. doing? Who am I? and that sense of meaning and purpose. So we have to rethink how can people develop that in a society where maybe there aren't uh, the jobs mm. available to bring that for them. Would you have an idea of what this can be, how this can be solved? Well, it's something that you know I've been thinking a lot about lately, uh, but I think people first and foremost have to realize that it's going to be a problem. Again, the idea that yes, we have uh, developed with technologies and changed and adapted as things change, like the horse and buggy to the car, but the speed of change is so fast mm -hmm. now, that's the problem. Okay, uh, if we look into the future now, uh, let's imagine, I was just imagining the future, <laughs> what, would, what will the human of the future look like in terms right. of technology? Right, well I think more and more things are getting done for humans and uh, you know, when you talk about autonomous cars, you talk about a smart house, you know, the whole IoT mm -hmm. array, 
is going to really bring um, a lot of tasks that people do. It's going to automate those things. So, in the at the end of the day, you know, w as more and more things are automated, what are people going to do? So, I think that um, a lot of people don't really think that through. You know, mm. that people call these occupations, the mm. things that occupy the time in your day. Okay. What will people do? So, mm. sometimes people think they're going to self-actualize and become philosophers or ballerinas or artists. So you can't and have seven billion of them. Well, that's the problem. Mm. So. Mm. Uh, you know, we may be amusing ourselves to death with entertainment and VR games space and things. Travel. Yeah, <laughs> imaginary space travel mm. with your goggles yeah. on. But um, I think that, uh, again, uh, what are people going to do? Mm. And we have to rethink even what a car is. Mm. You know, as it automates, it, it's not simply uh, something to get you from point A to point B. It can be a mobile office. Okay. It can be any of these kinds of things. So we have to redesign even what these spaces are about. Okay. Don't forget you can follow Data Economy on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn and also visit the website on www.data-economy.com.